in greetings to you from Chamba Vairi Reformed Baptist Church. <clears throat> to just say one or two things about uh, uh, Chamba Valley, I think it is something we really thank God for, for you in our behalf, that the Lord has been gracious from its inception up to uh, today. When we went to Chamba Valley, I think one of the difficulties we had was finding a meeting place. But when we found the lecture theater at uh, Fairview Reformed, not, not Fairview um, Education, College of Education, we were excited because the place was quite spacious and very uh, neat. But thank God we did not take that to heart and take the, uh, they are welcome to us occupy their place for granted. We thought there will be one day when the school will say, we don't need you here. Um, so where are we going to go? And Chamber Valley is not like this place where there is this secondary school and many others where you can ask for a room. We began to, uh, to do some building projects and we said, let's just do a slab. And then we did a slab just in case they, they chase us. We can pitch up a tent on the slab. But it seems when you begin to do uh, the work of building project, it's like a baby when it just stands on its leg, the other leg, and then it makes one move, it is gone. And that's basically what we have actually seen the work uh, at Chamber Valley. Today, we are almost done. We've painted in and out. We are just remaining to work on the floor. I think those of you who visit the social media, you will see what the Lord has done uh, to us through you in his work. In my company, I've come with my wife. <clears throat> We've left our children back home. But one thing I want to also uh, uh, report is that we are all fine. <clears throat> when I was taking up the work of ministry, my children were the last to be converted to actually buy into my calling. They said something like, oh, but daddy was stopping work. What about school? <laughs> then I said, what do you mean? They say that pastors don't get paid. How are we going to school? They said, no, the Lord will provide. Uh, and uh, thank God, today I'm, I'm reporting to you. None of them has ever questioned why we are in the ministry and what they are doing with school. Because I've got now three of my children entering one is in the third year the other two have just entered first year one will be doing civil one is doing civil engineering and the other one public health none of them has ever raised the question to actually find out if we will, they will stop school uh, the lord has actually proved his graciousness thanks for your prayers let me now turn to uh, the scripture and ask you to turn to the book of Acts and chapter 2. This has been one of the commitments we've had when we began the work, we associated ourselves with a, a situation in the scripture that is like ours. And we went to study the book of Acts. And it took us four years to basically wind up in this study. And from this, I just want us to look at chapter 2 and verse 42 to verse 47. My concern in this passage of scripture is seeking to answer a question. How does a health Christian look like? Oh, what is the portrait of a health Christian? Because this seems to be a struggle and a problem for many 
who are Christians and are really struggling with uh, assurance of salvation, and those who are not Christians, they are really trying to measure themselves with uh, a Christian, especially here in Zambia where uh, Zambia has been declared as a Christian nation. Let us read that passage of scripture. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 up to verse 47. If you are there, the Bible reads, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions, goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad, sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And I think I must report here that we have noted something of this blessing of adding to our numbers. Um, the Lord has actually um, added to our number. We are now 32 in membership. Pray that we have leadership um, chosen or elected into uh, the existing one. We are looking probably by the end of October to have an ordination, God willing. Let us just pray. Our dear blessed God and mighty Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Lord, we are grateful to you for this time that you've given to us as we come to study your word. Lord, as we listen to you preach to us, we pray that through your servant you will provide a bedrock on which your church will indeed stand their feet and use it for their well-being in the most holy faith. And therefore, I pray that you use me as you've never used me before, that I might only speak as one who has been sent by you. And for this reason, I pray that you will do these things for us in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Lord, we pray that after all has been said and done, the question of a portrait of a healthy Christian will be answered to some who are in this auditorium. Do these things, Lord, we pray, as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. For the years I served in the uh, health industry, one of the major issues I observed was in what is called maternal and child health care, and particularly regarding the delivery of babies. One of the concerns of the, the mother or the parents and the doctors is a baby who is born and has not cried. In most cases, when the baby is born, they turn it upside down, touch it at the back, to see if the meconium, is it amniotic fluid will come out and the meconium, then it will cry. Because if that is not done, it poses a serious health challenge to the baby. It might not be a normal child. Or further still, a situation where the child is not living or growing according to its age in comparison to fellow peers. It is considered or said it has got what is a condition known as failure to thrive. 
And this condition of failure to thrive, it is noted when the child is not gaining weight, growing like he or she should, they have a lot of, as it were, reasons to actually think that they are not growing. And I think this is the same condition and concern to the believers. A Christian who has been born again for years, they have not been showing growth of any kind, spiritually speaking. In the health term, they might be termed as failure to thrive. Our text this morning, which we have read, gives us a picture of a healthy portrait of a Christian or even the church at large. And we see this happening to the early church during the time of Pentecost and forward. It was not a perfect church. You and I know the problems which rocked this church in its early inception. But what we see is that nevertheless, God was still at work in their midst. As you can see, Acts is a record of what Jesus Christ continued to do and teach through his people after his ascension. And on the day of Pentecost, he called to himself, as it were, as we see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 9, 3,000 people were added to the 120. And now we read in verse 47, the passage we have read, the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. Friends and brethren, Jesus himself was at work in the early church and this picture shows us the marks of a healthy Christian so that we can actually measure ourselves with this experience or development for our example. So, a sound Christian, therefore, or a sound church, therefore, has this portrait which is characterized by constant devotion to the Lord. And that's what we have seen in the passage in verse 42. Not only do they have this constant devotion to the Lord, but they have constant devotion to God's people. In Bemba, when you are marrying a woman who has a child or children, you don't say, I'll just marry you and away with your children. You have come in the family of Christ and it's a big family. You need to love his people. Thirdly, not only are we supposed to constantly, as it were, uh, love the Lord and his people, but we will love the Lord's work in the world. Those three will occupy our study this morning. And the first thing, therefore, the devotion to the Lord. We see this in verse 42. And I read, They continued, they continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship of the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Friends and brethren, a spiritually sound Christian, including the church, must actually be characterized by the love for God. And this is basically what we see in the gospel according to Matthew 22 and verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest command. 
Oh, friends and brethren, the way they are continually devoting points to constancy or purpose or resolve. It's not something which is done half-heartedly. It is done with purpose. They were continually devoted to the apostles' teaching. And there are two things which we can appreciate as we notice this constant devotion to the Lord. And the first thing I want to you to follow me up with is the very fact that through the teaching of the word, it will tell our devotion to the Lord. And that's basically what we have been taught here. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Friends and brethren, these people who were gathered at this point in time came from different localities and places. And they gathered at this point for something else, but they were met with conversion. And to teach such kind of a number of people, oh friends and brethren, we pray that God brings conversion. To have 3,000 people converted at your church, it is heartwarming, but it is great work. And what we have here is the very fact that these people who came from different backgrounds, while well, most of them had some biblical background, they were ignorant about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, the apostles had a massive job at hand to ground these people in their newfound faith before they returned home. So, they have done with, as it were, these people as Christ had dealt with them. I think we read that passage of scripture. In Luke chapter 24, verse 27, beginning with, them, with Moses and with all the prophets, they explained it to them, the things concerning Jesus in all the scriptures. One of the fears I struggled to enter into ministry is I may run dry. But friends and brethren, scripture is the fountain of knowledge that cannot be exhausted. And at Chamber Valley, we have resorted to preach the whole counsel of God beginning from Genesis and ending up to Revelation. We do not want someone when they have left and they have showers about what the book of Revelation is all about. And this is the point here, friends and brethren. We live in the time and age when evangelical churches and Christians at large, some often minimize and even dis uh, disregard sound doctrine. Instead, they are happy with a message that tickles their emotions and such experiences. And that is the reason why when the man of God, when you see these tele, is it the so-called apostles and papas, they will tell you what you want to hear. Can I prophesy? And they will say, yes. Can I do a miracle? They say, yes. That's what tickles them. But when it comes to sound doctrine, they cringe. The apostle Paul as he writes to Timothy and Titus, this was the core of his exhortation and charge. When he says to them, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, not prophesy or do miracles. He goes on to warn Timothy that time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. 
Therefore, a healthy Christian must measure themselves up with sound doctrine because God has chosen to review himself in the written words. And if you really want to test somebody's love for the word and you've promised them a gift, just slot it in the Bible. They will find, you will find that Bible the way you left it. And yet the promise was just slotted in the note in that Bible. Not only do we appreciate the fact that there is devotion to the word of God. But in the second aspect, we see that there is devotion to the corporate worship. Now, this point has something to do with the relationship between God and man. And here, a faithful preaching of God's word should result in worship. In that it should bring us to an encounter with God himself, which is the power of true worship in the evening. I will lead you into the worship before the throne in the book of Revelation. You will not fail to see this when biblical truth is expounded in its entirety and faithfulness. It draws men and women to worship, including angels. So, here in this passage of scripture, there are several aspects of worship which are very obvious and categorical for a sound Christian and the sound church at large. And among them, there are three which have been provided to us in the text. Firstly, the Lord's Supper. Verse 42, they devoted themselves or they, they were continually devoting themselves to the breaking of bread. Apparently, COVID has modified this kind of worship. I don't think many of the churches are still having the breaking of bread. Now, here... The breaking of bread refers to the Lord's Supper. But I wonder if the Lord's Supper would be one of the four things which are distinguishing the evangelical churches today. And I say this with a heavy heart because there are some people who actually say if you celebrate the Holy Communion too often, it becomes monotonous. Well, even the study of the Bible can be monotonous at times. It can actually be a routine, for lack of a better term. If you do the, it every day, but I hope that we do not actually read our Bible and pray less often so that we do not become or it doesn't become a routine. Friends and brethren, it should make us examine our lives as we look at this passage of scripture. The solution is that this idea of the Lord's Supper is basically the very fact that it reminds us of what great truth God has actually brought to the world through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us so that I, I and you could be forgiven and be reconciled to God. So, it must make there for us examine our lives so that we confess and turn from all our known and besetting sins. And that's basically what we do when we sit to partake of the Lord's Supper. Secondly, on this devotion to corporate worship is prayer. 
they continually were devoting themselves to prayers. Friends and brethren, this has to do with the corporate prayers. Whenever and what, whenever the church meets together, whether it is in a large community or it is in the temple or it is house to house or cell group, prayer ought to be woven into the fabric of church life. A church or saints who have a laissez-faire attitude to prayer must be pitied. And I say this, friends and brethren, with a heavy heart. Because you hear some people would say things like, are you coming to the prayer meeting? No, I think I'll come when the preaching of God's word starts and they also think like, there is just a prayer meeting. Friends and brethren, this is the very blood life of a Christian who is healthy. A person or a Christian who does not pray is a target of attack for the evil one. There is a brother who usually posts... A lot of uh, uh, quotes from E.M. Bounds. And sometimes we would post it very early hours in the morning. And when I read that, I just remember, oh, have I prayed? Prayer is as breath is to the baby who is born and has not yet cried. It is a worrisome if the baby doesn't cry, it might actually be dead. Not only do we appreciate the very fact that a portrait of a healthy Christian will be noted by their love for prayer, but thirdly, in this worship, there is praise and joy. Verse 46. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity. Their lives were marked by joy because of what God or Jesus had done on the cross for them and in the behalf of others. And that's what we see in verse 47, praising God is, as it were, a present participle, or is it participle? These are the things we struggled with in English. We only got serious with them because we need to know them. But that's what we see here. It is, it is actually in, a, in what is called the present participle. Pointing to the ongoing common expression of praise to God. I know Pentecostals are very zealous. They will never think, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But, it no doubt marks their corporate times of worship, but it also radiates out of the cracks of their daily lives, drawing others to the source of their joy. I'm sure you've noted some Christians who are more zealous than you, and you wonder why they are always beaming with joy. It's this. What God has done in their lives, and probably added to it what it has done in their friends, I think one of the latest conversions we had was a young girl who we baptized and then the neighbor was invited to our YP program and because there were games which we said would be uh, done and because of the game this girl came but it's that day that she had the true gospel 
which disturbed her life and she never enjoyed sleep. She was a pain to the parents, both the mother and the father. Especially the father is a stepfather. She never accepted him. The first thing she said in that testimony, I had to make amend with the people I've hated. Friends and brethren, true gospel, well handled and preached, it changes lives. We must be worried if we are preaching and people are not getting converted. Yes, it is God's sovereign. But our responsibility is to preach the word and preach it unreservedly. There is only one way to develop that kind of a constant joy and praise is deliberately to focus your mind on God. If then you have been raised up with Christ, says uh, the Apostle Paul to the Colossians in chapter 3 and verse 1. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of, the, of God. Friends and brethren, we see the same in the Psalms. Oftentimes the psalmist was in dire straits. But he resolved to focus on the Lord. Psalm 57 and verse 7. David wrote and sang the song in the cave. He was not somewhere jubilating or having fun or good time. He was in the cave pursued by the mad king Saul. God's people must resolve as it were, or must be resolved to give praise and be joyous because of what he has done in their lives. Oh, friends and brethren, a good and healthy Christian will not deliberately therefore develop a memory lapse concerning God in his teaching and in his corporate worship. How come? You don't forget when it is time for your outing to go and have a pizza. But you forget so easily that today is the day of prayer. Why? Therefore, the first mark of a healthy Christian is this continual devotion to the Lord. It must be constant in the sense of deliberate resolve to be in his word and to be in his worship. Not only do we appreciate devotion to the Lord, but the second thing we see which characterized a portrait of a healthy Christian is devotion to the Lord's people. And we see this in the second part of that verse 42 b by this sorry they continually devoting themselves to the fellowship and that's friends and brethren is what actually characterized the constant devotion to the lord and his people In John chapter 15, verse 35, there we see the Lord Jesus Christ putting this point in its perspective. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Friends, it is such a great contradiction in your life to devote yourself to the head who is Christ Jesus and at the same time you cut yourself away from the body of Christ. Maybe you might be thinking we are talking about someone who is not here. A test is this. When we come out here, are you just going to rush into your car and go? Because you don't like mixing with people. Friends and brethren, this is a contradiction. We need fellowship of believers 
What does this mean to devote yourself to fellowship? I think the Greek word is that popular word known as koinonia. And this koinonia basically is what is expressed also in verse 44. All these who believed were together and had all things in common. None. They were together is the koinonia there. It was not each one for himself and God for us all. We see this repeated also in verse 47. The Lord was adding to their number, literally together, those who were being served. The stress here, friends and brethren, this sense of togetherness when it says they were one, they were of one mind and took as it were their meals together is basically what fellowship entails. So, being devoted to the fellowship is a commitment to be built together with those who have joined God's family, being served. Friends and brethren, so, even though the body of Christ is not nearly as lovely as its head, Christ himself, the Bible commands us to love one another, to love the fellowship of God. And that is basically the purpose why the writer to the Hebrews aged the Hebrews to get together in 10 and 25. When it says there, let us not forsake assembling together with other believers. Friends and brethren, there are many verses in the Bible which talks and encourages about fellowship. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against one, forgive as the Lord forgave. There are four things I want to just run you through concerning this devotion to the Lord's people. Firstly, sound fellowship is enhanced or it thrives among truly converted people. You cannot have fellowship or sound fellowship with people of different faiths or different beliefs in terms of salvation. Verse 47 there is telling us that those who were added to the fellowship were being saved to the Lord. Oh, some were actually not saved. They may have attended both their large gatherings and in their home meetings. They were not part of the fellowship. Can I bring it home? You may have associated with us for 30 years. That's how old Kawata Baptist Church is. And we mistake you to even be a brother. If you are not converted, you are not part of the fellowship of God. You must be saved. You need Christ in your life. Because it is only those who have been saved, those whose sins are forgiven, who will go in the evening, who have been washed in the, in the blood of the Lamb, and their clothes are made as white as who, who have fellowship with God. You cannot have fellowship with the church of God by Mary coming to church always and being a good boy and girl. You will go to hell with such kind of understanding. <sighs> to be saved means to be delivered from God's wrath and judgment that we deserve because of our sin. We are saved means we have a changed government. 
a change authority, power, commitment, system, and the world. Right now, many people are still losing jobs. Those whose jobs depend on that man appointing them. Because there is a change of government. You cannot, as it were, keep on thriving on the malfunctioning government. Not necessarily that the previous government was malfunctioning, but the devil's government is. You can't continue mal- working under the government of the evil one in the new government. No. There is one who is seated on the throne and he has authority and he has given that authority to his church and his church goes in that authority winning souls on his behalf in this wicked and perverse generation. That is what you see in a Christian or a person who has been changed. His commitment, if he was a man who was always in love with the DJ, he now changes. He is in love with Asaf. Why? The commitment has changed and the systems which he operated on, he is now under the government of Christ Jesus. But only do they thrive as it were in uh, the commitment or the, 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 the enhancement of the fellowship, not only does it thrive in truly saved people, but secondly, it thrives in being togetherness. And this is what we have already seen in verse 46. Right from the inception of the early church, togetherness has been the practice of the church. Certainly, COVID is working against that. But they were together. It began with 3,120. And soon the number grew to 5,000 as we see it in four, Acts 4 and chapter 4. And then it went on burning like wildfire. And now here we are. Part of that repo of the gospel. Is it going to stop with you? Oh, friends and brethren, there are two levels of Christian unity we can appreciate in this. Firstly, these togetherness, these who are saved, there is unity of the Spirit in their lives. I wonder how, uh, what do you call Political alliances manage to thrive together. But that's not so with this. What we see here, friends and brethren, is that those who are saved, they have been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ, as we see it in Ephesians 4 verse 3. And 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. Paul commands us to to preserve this sincere spirit as it already exists in those we find who are saved. What it means is that you are not just going to come in this church and bring kavuluvulu. The way they say, the way the word sounds, and that's the way it is, eh? Confusion. Not only do we see the unity of the spirit among the saints, but we also see that there is the unity of the faith, which are to, are to be attained as we, as it were, deepen ourselves into the knowledge of God and grow to spiritual maturity. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Believers who know Christ and his word well have deepened their fellowship than those who do not know 
Christ well in this area. Not only do we appreciate that enhanced fellowship thrives in the being together, which is seen in the unity of spirit and faith, but thirdly, it thrives in sharing together in God's things. Oftentimes, Christians get together and spend the whole time talking about news, weather, sports, and whatever it is. There's nothing wrong with those things when we meet and spend and talk on those, those of us who are in that group of football. There's nothing wrong. But at, why at, at, this, at the same point, at some point, the conversation needs to move to the deeper level. If the Lord and his salvation are the center of our lives and of our souls, then we actually need to deepen this together as we talk about the things of the way of the things of Christ. One of the things which I would get amazed in our time, how people were very ready to share their testimony, how they became a Christian. I haven't really seen it in this part of my <laughs> age of life, but I think we did a lot of this. Not only really did they share in the testimony, they shared in the material things. They, no one was found wanting. We have been taught there that they broke bread when they met. Now, friends and brethren, there is something to be said for food and fellowship going together. These early Christian brethren were taking their meals together in verse 46. The fact that their meals are referred to here as breaking of bread might suggest that these were not elaborate feasts, but just common meals. Friends and brethren, this is where I have a point to advise those of our brethren who always want to do, to enjoy this togetherness by sharing things when you have a lot. I can assure you, eternity will come. You are still trying to have a lot. The time to share in things is now. Whatever it is that you have, you can share with the other fellow who doesn't have, or you can share with other people who actually are in need. I think one of the major issues has to do with hospitality. One of the problems we were actually thinking in our early life with Mary was, how can we be hospitable? I think this list just to pack a meko. No. Ask me in Russia we used to go seven months, no salary. When are you going to Pakama? The members have got a good saying at when you walk away, idea if you call away idea, meaning a, a, a guest to the monkey must eat what the monkey provides. In other words, if you eat as it were uh, dry, roasted mess, have fellowship on that. If you have, as it were, beddings which cover you, use the same with the brother who actually has visited. What is important is this togetherness of fellowship. If you are waiting when you become as it were well off, you will not. Not only do we see the thrive in sharing together in God's things, but fourthly, enhanced fellowship thrives in us sharing the material things. And I think that is basically what uh, this 44 is all about. They shared material things 
And what we must act, actually appreciate is that however the situation in, in Jerusalem was somewhat unique, thousands of pilgrims had, 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 had traveled there for the feast at the day of Pentecost. And many had just been saved after Peter's preaching. And they wanted to stay longer to get grounded in their new found faith. They needed hospitality, finances to help them to live a little bit longer in that area. And to meet these needs, the church opened up their homes and their, their pockets as it were of their stores to help the needy. Some even sold land and donated the proceed, although this was not required. Friends and brethren, if you might be here, you might say, wow, this doesn't apply to me. Friends, we need to remember that we are all exhorted to be generous and hospitable. You might not be as hospitable as the other family, but in your small way, do your part to practice generosity and hospitality. It is in such that others have actually received angels. Ask Abraham and his wife. We need to remember that we are all exhorted to be generous. Remember to share with those in need. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 18. We are told not to share as it were with a brother or a sister in need of the basics of life. Sorry, I will repeat that. We are told not to share with a lazy or irresponsible person who refuses to work. He has got a master's, he has got a degree, but the chap just wants a white collar job. There is another job where he can do clerical work and what and earn bread. He is just bothering brethren. God forbid. Such, we must not encourage and share with them. We must encourage them to work. Oh, friends and brethren, therefore, a person who calls himself a Christian and are not striving in the things I've mentioned to you above may not be a healthy Christian. They need a touch of the great physician, our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. That is what we must actually bear in mind if we want to measure ourselves with a portrait of a healthy Christian. Thirdly and finally, must be devoted to God's work. Biblical Christianity is all about God's work and mission. The more reason why there is a work for Jesus and for everyone. No, I think me, I'm just uh, one year in the faith. I'm still trying to learn how to do it. You will not. The girl I'm telling you is a grade seven. And it is happening. Friends and brethren, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20 tells us that mandate, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey Everything I've commanded you, lo, I am with you always. Healthy Christian must, as it were, be marked by constant devotion to God's work and his mission in this world. Even if the next does not actually do it, 
Your duty is to obey the master. Don't look to Joseph or Jen that they are not doing it. You will not be answerable to them. Look to Jesus. The truth of the matter is that though others were not, may not have been doing, yet it was those who were saved who shared the faith with others, not sound theologians. Let me tell you something here, friends and brethren. New believers often are the best evangelists because they have a largest pool of unbelievers. And therefore, you must take advantage of this newfound life in the Lord Jesus Christ to go and make disciples among your colleagues or those unbelieving friends. And so, they should be learning basics of the gospel presentation, the Bible verses that communicate the gospel. This reminds me of Mwindula. When we were starting the new work in Chamba Valley, they were coming to our church for, I think, six months or so. So when we invited him to preach, he said, how I knew that Pastor Kawambale's sermon is about to end is when the water bottle finishes. <laughs> Friends and brethren, some of the evangelism took place through the miracles that the apostles were performing. Verse 43, and the preaching that as it were accompanied these miracles, we see it in chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 26. The ability to perform these miracles was limited to the apostles and their close associates, like Philip. And the miracles as it were confirmed that these were men or messengers and identified them that they are messengers of God. So, I do not hear a spouse or seeking to bring to us the belief that extraordinary gifts and miracles exist today, though God can do that in his sovereignty. Hebrews tells us in chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, that he shall, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation which was first announced by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. Although at times God does perform these miraculous signs and wonders in his uh, sovereignty. But our main focus and aim must be to proclaim Christ and him crucified. Friends and brethren, it is such a humbling task that God has given this key in the hands of the saints, you and I. God will not send angel Gabriel to evangelize. No, it's not their duty. It's yours and mine. Are you being busy in the vineyard? Yes, there is COVID and we are not really having Oh, so, <laughs> there is social distance. Are you being busy in the vineyard of God? Or even in your lockdown situation, what initiative have you been applying? We've never known conversions and baptism than in this year when we have COVID. So far, we've baptized six. There are four people undergoing baptism today. In COVID! Friends and brothers, God is not tied by COVID and the virus. We must wake up to reality. Evangelism is primarily God's work. 
but he does it through us. It is the Lord who adds to the church those who are being saved, but we are responsible to share the gospel. Not that the Lord added the new converts together with the church, literally to their number, as we see it in verse 47. He does not save people without adding them to the church where they can grow. And people are not truly added to the church until they are saved. What am I saying? In the kingdom of God, there is nothing like a freelance Christian. Take that to Zambia Media Association of Zambia. In the faith, you belong to the local church. Are you a member of the local church here or wherever you've come from? Because that's what we have been told here. They were added to their number. What are you waiting for? Oh, friends and brethren, there is a sense in which a healthy Christian will be reproducing Christians. Granted, there are special times of God's sovereign work where many hundreds, if not thousands, are saved in this short period of time. We are not expecting that as a norm, but we should be entreating the Lord to add to his church often those who are being saved. If we are not seeing conversions, we should examine ourselves to ask why. Because a healthy Christian is devoted to the Lord, to his people, and to his work. What is it that we are not doing in this triad? I must conclude here, friends and brethren. Though there is no church that is perfect and none will come close in this side of the age. But as we continually devote ourselves to the Lord through his word, through his worship, and devote ourselves through fellowship to his people, and as we devote ourselves to work in this world, he will use us to glorify himself. Therefore, I challenge you to be fervent in your devotion to the Lord, to his church, and to his people, and to his work in this world. But I'm still mindful of the fact that there are those of you who are still strangers to the grace of God. Friend and brethren, why have I called you brethren? Time is coming when you will be called upon to account. Which group will you be in? Will you be in the fellowship of God or you will be in the camp of the dragon and his minion? All has been laid before you today. Turn to him in repentance and faith today. Amen. Let's pray. Our blessed mighty God, we want to thank you that you have not left us as orphans, but that in your word you have commanded us on how we ought to conduct ourselves if we are to exhibit life of vitality as a healthy Christian and a healthy church. To this effect, we pray, O oh Lord, that if there be any ways in which we have lapsed, look with pity on us and help us, O oh Lord, with this exhortation to begin afresh. Hear our plea and our prayer as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.